now is the time where we get to just be in the stillness together and meditate. One of my favorite things to do. This week, I have just been so grateful for this practice. Um, I always am. And just extra gratitude this week to be able to come back to the stillness in a place that all we have to do is be still and everything that we need to know is revealed. We just need to listen and be willing and receptive. So we'll spend a few moments in that, that space together today. And as the theme of the talk is grace today, I thought that we could, as we move into meditation, use the word grace to come back to. So anytime you feel or experience yourself being in the future or the past or involved in a story or thought that is unrelated to the truth with a capital T, we come back to the word grace. And we just say it slowly to ourselves and allow grace to embody us. So we'll just close our eyes for a few moments together. And as you take your first few breaths with your eyes closed and in the stillness, and just open our hearts to gratitude and thanksgiving that we get to be together today, that we get to be together and go within today. And in this moment, we recognize and acknowledge any feelings, emotions, sensations, events of the day, and we just allow them to be exactly as they are. We allow ourselves to be exactly as we are. As we breathe and open ourselves to grace. And we just feel that grace at the back of all things, that when we surrender, we can float like we're floating on a cloud in grace and so we'll spend a few moments in the stillness together coming back to grace with each breath this moment, noticing where is your attention? And can you lovingly guide yourself back to this moment right now?
with every breath, we come back to the grace of our being, the grace that is guiding us, the grace that is always supporting us. So, as we begin to close out this time of stillness, take a moment to just feel your own heart space, your own place of love and gratitude within you. And then feel that connection to each and every individual in this community that we've just created this beautiful, loving, open space of gratitude filled with grace together. And so we feel that for ourselves and we feel it for each other in this moment. And to close out the meditation, let's take a full inhale breath together. and easefully exhale out. And as you're ready, allow your eyes to open, bringing your attention back into the space together. Thank you, Juliet. And Audrey, if you'll lead us in today's readings. Thank you, Juliet, for creating that beautiful container of grace and gratitude. Grace is one of my favorite things to to talk about and feel. Today's reading is adapted from Unity's Daily Word by David. When I falter, if I stumble in life, I may feel as though I failed. At dark times of discouragement, Grace is a light shining on the horizon, a glimmer of hope. Grace is such a wonderful gift, the blessing that has come to me as forgiveness, healing, and prosperity. Grace is also the gift I give by being of service, showing kindness, and offering forgiveness. Through grace, I rise, even after falling. Through grace, I hope, even after losing. I leave the past behind and start anew, wiser, stronger, and kinder. What I seek is also seeking me, and so it is. So please join me in our opening affirmation. There is only one power and one presence active in the universe and in my life, God in everything and everyone. The one infinite source of love, abundance, harmony, wholeness, intelligence, and joy is expressing as me. Thank you so much, Audrey. (laughs) I forgot to take a little tidbit from last week's reading off of the, off of the uh, order of service, but it fit beautifully. (laughs) And that's grace. So it's interesting that my very first talk at a spiritual center was about grace. And that talk was in 2015, where I was invited to be a guest speaker at Unity San Jose. And as I've said many times, it it was grace that brought me here. It may seem like something that just happened by chance until you see it as the correlation of seemingly unrelated events. 
And, and that's something to remember that the correlation of seemingly unrelated events, these little pieces of the puzzle, they seem like they're random, but there is no randomness. Uh, as Einstein said, God does not play dice with the universe. So grace is a uh, very commonly used word, especially in spiritual circles. And, and quite often I was noticing that there was a book about grace that didn't even have a chapter on grace. It was, it just had to do with a lot of other things, but uh, I'm ready to explore that more expansive de definition of grace um, later in this talk. But I want to begin with what we classically um, think of when we think of grace in our new thought community. And I'm going to start with something that Michael Beckwith said, Michael Beckwith said, grace is the total givingness of spirit. Grace is the total givingness of spirit. And I say that grace is a gift that's being given regardless of what's been said or done, regardless of whether you think you earned it or deserved it. It is a gift bestowed upon you, regardless of anything you've done or not done, whether it shows up as a God wink or a huge miracle in your life. It's all grace. You may have heard the story about the prodigal son in the Bible. Uh, it's a story of a father that has two sons. The younger son asks for his part of the inheritance early from his father. And he, and he gets that inheritance. And that son goes on to squander it all, eventually becoming lost and destitute. So the son crawls back home and begs his father to accept him back as a servant after squandering everything that he had been given. And to the son's surprise, the father didn't scorn him. The father wasn't angry. The father welcomed him back with open arms. Um, and, and this is, uh, I, I can't quote it exactly, but the father said, um, you, were you were once lost and now you are found. And the joy that the father had, this is grace. And I'm sure if the father had everything to give again, he would give it again to the older son or to the younger son. But grace in general can be hard to grasp with our logical minds. Grace is out beyond the law of attraction, I think, because the law of, attract of attraction is ask and it is given. But grace is simply it is given regardless of our asking. And you could call grace some people call it fourth dimensional work because it's outside of the realm of our three dimensional thinking. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, you know, it's really hard to grasp this realm, but we do feel the benefits of grace tangibly right here. So to me, grace is one of the most important languages that God speaks to us through grace, the language of grace. And, and grace is important because it's an affirmation that there's something more than the ordinary going on. So when you are in, in doubt of the God of your understanding, when you are in doubt of your faith, when you're losing hope, grace will reach out and say, I'm here. I'm here. But because grace goes beyond scientific thinking, like I said earlier, it's, it's hard to expect grace. I was watching a, a video from Marianne Williamson yesterday uh, where she talks about a book that she wrote called Everyday Grace. And she says, the world trains us to be on the lookout. I'm paraphrasing. She, the world trains us to be on the lookout for everything that is not magic. The world trains us to be on the lookout for blame, on the lookout for fault. But she says, when your thinking has been converted to a spiritual perspective. It's like putting on a different set of glasses and you're looking through the lens of the spirit now, the spiritual you. Then you are on the lookout for blessings. You're on the lookout for the good of pe in people instead of the bad in people. And perhaps you're on the lookout for grace. And that's, that's what I would like us all. If I had one takeaway from today, it would be be on the lookout for grace. According to Marianne Williamson, um, she said, we must unlearn a dominant paradigm that happened, that began in the, the Industrial Revolution, 
I looked up. So when did the industrial revolution start? It started between, I think, 1760 and 1820-ish, right? So about roughly for 200 years, we've had this material worldview that keeps on getting more strong and more strong and more strong that says there are no miracles. There is no grace. There is just the material empirical world, only the things that can be measured with our rational minds and logic and scientific instruments, right? That's the world that we grew up in. And it's interesting to think about this world is just a sliver of human time, like less than one fraction of a percent of time of humanity has been spent in this world outside of miracles and magic. Most of our existence as a human species has been in the realm of miracles and magic. According to Marianne Williamson, this recent sliver in time is what has marginalized spirit. It's marginalized magic. Uh, it's why books like Harry Potter and uh, thousands of books and thousands of TV shows, Marvel and DC, and are, are attracting people because they are what our hearts want to know is real. Magic. They are about magic, not just fantasy. They are about, and that magic is not something that's beyond attainment. That magic is the realm of miracles. And science is causing us to doubt that. But even traditional scientific worldview is in question. Science is now questioning what reality is. All the things that we thought were true about the atoms, uh, quantum physics and uh, uh, looking at the very micro has said, we're not sure we can observe or locate anything and observe it as reality in the way we thought of before. It just keeps floating in and out of energy. Uh, so I, I guess I can say scientists are still trying to figure out what reality is. And there are more possibilities of the answers than ever before. And the really big questions in science, the bigger the question you ask, the more spiritual the answer becomes. So we all want this grace, but in the busyness of our lives, we often forget that it's right under our nose. So I'm going to just recall a few times in my life that grace showed up. And I'll try to make this brief, but these are pretty amazing. I had a job interview before I got my current job, and I was looking around online at LinkedIn. And up pops this article about, oh, here are some interesting interview questions that could be asked. Here's some really, some real uh, zingers, if you will. And the question was, ask a candidate how much money is spent in the U.S. on weddings every year. But don't just take an answer. Ask them to explain how they got to that answer. And I was thinking, oh, gosh, you would have to figure out, like, You'd have to rationalize okay, how much money is spent on a wedding. Then you'd have to say, well, how many people are getting married each year? How many people got divorced? How many people are there available in the United States to get married? But, you know, all, all these things. And I started to write down on a cocktail napkin or a, a napkin, since I don't drink cocktails, um, what the answer would be for me. And I went through this process. Okay. Two days later, I'm interviewing for this job. Guess what they asked me? They asked me, so David, how much money do you think is spent on weddings each year in the United States? Tell me your thought process on getting to that. And I couldn't believe it because somehow I had seen the answer two days before. I was just blown away. That was grace in such a big way because it took away the sheer panic. And it was, it was a huge God wink. It was God saying, yeah, I've got you, David. I've got you in small ways and in big ways. And that's this, the correlation of seemingly unrelated events. So I think about grace as a divine intervention. I think about grace as a protector. When I was in the eighth grade, I was the valedictorian. And right before my speech, 20 minutes before my speech, I realized, and, and that was the first speech of any size I'd given in, in my life to the largest audience I'd ever given. I, my knees were shaking. And I realized that my speech wasn't in my pocket, my jacket pocket. I couldn't find it. So I just said, okay, I'm just going to go wandering around the school grounds where my mom dropped me off to find it. 
And it was this, this piece of paper was uh, blowing around in the wind in front of the school. And I got it and I got it and I caught it. It was my speech. To think what a different world. I still have that speech. To think what a different world it would have been if I would have maybe not found that speech. And what a huge, uh, that, that thing could have blown anywhere. But I found it. So these near misses, I'll share one more. When my mom uh, was driving uh, me home from school, I was in the front seat. In those days, seat belts were like kind of optional. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> and uh, she, the, a car just uh, uh, pulled out on the street in front of us really fast, just speeding through. And she slammed on brakes and my head hit the windshield and broke it. It broke it to the extent that it was shattered and pieces of my hair were in the windshield. And everybody looked at me and said, are you okay? They're, you know, my brother was in the backseat, my sister and, and her girlfriend, they were all in shock. And I said, yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> now you can make all the jokes you want about me having a hard head, but the doctors said that I, I must have hit in the exact spot where a soccer player might head a ball. But if I would have had a slightly different tilt on my head, I would have broken my skull open or broke my neck for sure. That was grace, the protecting nature of grace. For those of you who've seen uh, the movie uh, Miracle on the Hudson, the story of Sully Sullenberger, have you seen that? It's if, if not, go see it because it talks about this plane that lost all of its engines as it was flying out of LaGuardia Airport. It ran into, um, it was a full plane and it ran into a bunch of birds and the engines went out one after the other. And it just so happened to be that this man in the, behind the pilot seat knew he had trained all of his life for situations like this. And the control tower was telling him, oh, you should, you should land at Teterboro and in, in New Jersey. And he said, no, I'm feeling that this plane is not going to make it. We've got, I'm going to ditch, I'm going to go to the Hudson River and I'm going to land the plane in there. And water landings are not known to be, have good outcomes, but he knew that that was the only choice he had. He had, he was the right pilot at the right time in the right moment. And he landed that plane and not a single person was killed. There was one stewardess who had some injuries to her leg um, but everyone was okay. They made it. And all the events after that landing, all the, 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 the boats, the barges that came in to, to rescue people, they got people out just in time before the plane sunk under the cold, frigid waters of the Hudson. At that time, it was unseasonably cold. So if you want to be really uplifted by a grace moment, um, watch that movie. I think it's called Miracle on the Hudson. Maybe you can put it in the chat if I'm mistaken. But grace is a mystery. We don't know how it works, but I will say that grace is the how. We say in New Thought, don't worry about the how. Don't worry about the how. I think grace is the how. So how do we cultivate more grace? I think these are my own theories. I think we, we need to get past the feeling that we are undeserving of the abundance of the universe. We need to get past that we need to be in the top X percent somehow to be graced. We are graced. And by changing that perspective, we become aware of grace that's already happening in our lives. If you just sat down and wrote down every moment where you experienced small grace, God winks and large grace, you, you would be surprised. And even looking backwards in time, thinking about things that happened that you thought, we're not good that turned out to be the best thing. Um, Michael Beckwith says we cultivate grace through opening up to its flow. And here are some helpful mantras. Oh my God, something wonderful is about to happen. Because we always say, oh my God, something awful is about to happen. This is called pronoia by a guy named Rob Resney. He wrote a book, wrote a book called Pronoia instead of Paranoia. Another one is by Esther Hicks. What if it all just works out? 
what if this were something better? And of course, there is what Don always signs his emails off with, all is well, all shall be well. In the end, all shall be well. So th this is the thinking of grace. I, I wanted to um, just share another thought. There was, a, there was a, a daily word reading from last year that was all about grace and about that we don't have to understand it. And it said this, it said, I believe there are solutions and remedies of which my limited human mind cannot currently conceive. When I let go, I am trusting the grace of God will bless my life in the most wondrous and even surprising ways. I believe the eventual outcome is actually going to be so much better than anything I could have ever imagined. So I will, I will leave it here. I have more to say on grace. I'm going to save that for a future talk, but um, let's just go into prayer for a moment. Let's just think about ourselves as not only receptors of grace, but as, as arbiters of grace, as transmitters of grace, as divine points of activating grace. And let's begin with showing ourselves grace, allowing ourselves to be the divine spirit that bestows upon ourselves grace giving ourselves the gift of healing, the gift of equanimity, the gift of power, the gift of peace, the gift of joy, even when we think we haven't deserved it or done anything to earn it. And then let's turn towards thinking of grace as a blanket of unconditional love and beginning with our lives, thinking about our lives, unconditionally loving everything, even the shadow side, unconditionally loving everything, even the seamed mistakes, unconditionally loving all the elements of our life, because how else can we unconditionally love the world but to love ourselves first? And this is showing the world grace forgiving ourselves, showing ourselves compassion and showing the world the same spirit. So I rest in that gratitude. I'm so grateful. I know it is done and so it is. Standing here in your presence In a grace so relentless I am one By perfect love Wrapped within the arms of heaven In a peace that lasts forever Sinking deep In mercy see I'm one Drawing close, stirred by grace, and all my heart is yours. All fear removed, I lean into your love. Oh, your is all I see. I give my everything. Life so deep, it washes over me. Your grace is all I seek. I give my everything. Life 
are so deep it washes over me your grace is all i seek i give my hand